I want to go really quickly to the word of God because all of us got church tomorrow. How many of us? Unless you're a Sabbath keeper, uh, all of us got. And if you're a Sabbath keeper, you're probably playing somewhere tomorrow. So everybody got church tomorrow. Amen. Now, did I say something wrong? Did I say it right? All right. I want you to go very quickly to, uh, to the word of God, even you that are watching us online. Let's go to, I have a few scriptures, but I'm just going to read. I'm going to read the Ezra text. Let's go to Ezra chapter 3, and I'm going to start reading verse 10 through verse 13. Ezra chapter 3, uh, verse 10 through verse 13. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me. It's good to see you, Pastor. It's good to see you in Jesus' name. Ezra chapter 3, verse 10 through 13. When you have to say amen. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course and praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were older or ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off and all of God's people said, Amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, I have a few more verses. I'll just give it to you as reference. But tonight I want to just minister just a, a few moments from the scripture, uh, uh, this Ezra scripture. And I want to give you a topic tonight. And my topic is, I'm glad I didn't get what I expected. I'm glad that I didn't get what I expected. Now, this just had, this is one of them uh sermon topics that you got to speak by faith you're either testifying or you're prophesying or you're wondering so i want everybody in faith to shout i'm glad i didn't get what i expected uh, very quickly i will go to the backdrop of this text to bring some sort of understanding to where we are tonight here in the annals of history of the children of israel the bible said it came a time because of their own disobedience and bad decisions that they were carried away captive. Now, if any of y'all said in any of my Bible classes before, either online or in person, I have a tendency to bring some sort of uh, unpacking to the Jeremiah chapter 29 text. And I do it because oftentimes we live in a generation that will take statements and we will post them and we will put them on T-shirts. We will make nice home decor out of them without giving context to it. Right. And so the Jeremiah 29 text, you've heard it before. If I start it, you know it, especially if you go down to verse number 11. It says, for I know the plans I have towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring you to an expected end you can go to hobby lobby you can go to any bible bookstore you can find statements uh pictures cards uh to give to individuals to encourage them and just say hey god has a plan for your life it's a nice wedding card god has a plan for your life it's a wonderful graduation gift god has a plan for your life and it is a beautiful scripture but to really understand it, you need to read the verses before it. This is why a lot of people don't like reading Old Testament, because to read Old Testament, to really understand it, you got to go to the chapter before it. And then after you get to the chapter before, you realize you need to go to the book before it. And then after a while, you say, I might as well start at Genesis chapter one. Uh -huh. So but what is the context of that scripture? That scripture is a prophetic scripture. But to tell you it needs to be unpacked is because it's an encouragement 
but it's uh, an encouragement from a prophet named Jeremiah. So that's suspect right there. An encouragement from the prophet Jeremiah. Somebody said, now why should I be concerned? Because we know Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. Now why would Jeremiah be called a weeping prophet? He's a weeping prophet not because of his equilibrium or his bipolar posture position of mental illness. He's weeping because of the message. See, some people want this, but some of us are not ignorant concerning the weight that comes with this. See, I'm talking about when a, a real man or woman of God realizes there's a responsibility that comes with the assignment. See, leadership is not about power. Leadership is about responsibility. And we're living in an hour where people want to take the glory of God and put it on a new cart of convenience. But David would tell you that if you study the ways of the Lord, the glory of God is not to be pushed on a cart with wheels, but the glory of God is to be carried on the shoulder of the men and women women of God I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor you got to carry this you got to carry this that means you don't get to show up when you feel like it you don't get to do it when it's convenient you don't get to serve them if they support you you got to serve whether they like you or not you don't get to choose your message I need you to look at somebody and tell them you don't get to choose your message you don't get to choose your assignment I am not a pimp I am a prophet so you can't put a quarter in me and get out what you want to get out I have no I I have no power over the message God gives me. I need you to look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, speak the truth. Speak the truth if you got to shake in your knees while you speak it. Speak the truth when people fold their arms and roll their eyes. Speak the truth because at the end of the day obedience is your responsibility and the results belong to God. I need you to push somebody tell them I'm a mailman. This ain't even my mail. I am a mailman. All God told me to do is to deliver it and some of us are so concerned with being affirmed and like that you're missing out on pleasing God at the end of the day as long as I please God that's all that matters I can say that now I couldn't always say that because I wanted to be liked I wanted to be in the group I wanted to be in the clique but some of us have grown up in God and says as a matter of fact I don't want to go out to eat as a matter of fact I like being by myself I can hang with people and then I can be by myself I can eat it with the crowd but I love sitting at a table and eating my food Food and paying for it myself. Jeremiah is encouraging us. But I'm saying, hold up, Jeremiah. You're not the encouraging type. You're a weeping prophet. So you telling me God has a plan for me. That he's gonna bring me to an expected end. Am I talking all right? Is that is just the way I preach? So then, let me read the verses before. The verses before, and I'll give you uh, the cliff notes on it. He says this. God says, I'm going to carry you away into exile. <sighs> your houses are going to be uh, tumbled. Your temple will be destroyed. And when you get to the foreign place, build houses, marry off your children. And if any prophet comes up and tells you that God is going to turn it around in 72 hours, they lying. You're going to be here for a minute. You got to go through this. Look at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor it didn't feel good when it was happening. But tell your neighbor I had to go through it. I had to go through it. And I don't care what nobody said. That's what, I, that's what I'm telling you. When things go out in the sanctuary, you got to know when it's for you. Because everything God ain't going to turn around in 24 hours. Yeah, if he turn it around by this time tomorrow, it may not be a 24 hour tomorrow. You got to be able to discern the timing of God. Amen. You got to know when everything is not spiritual warfare. Come on. It ain't spiritual warfare. Your house is going in repossession. That, that may not be spiritual warfare. It may be you got yourself into something that God never told you to get into. Oh my God. That ain't spiritual warfare because they took it. You didn't pay the bill. 
Stop y'all. Stop rebuking supervisors and bosses who wrote you up, or who who fired you, and calling it demonic in the spirit of Jezebel and Leviathan. No, you kept showing up to work late. And I believe this is why God allows some of us to go through things longer than we should have to go through them. It's because we are mislabeling our journey. This is why you can't play with your kids when they smack you in the face as babies. You got to say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. And when you have to tap, you have to tap with a strong face. You can't laugh. They got to know the difference between what's real and what's a joke. And the Lord says, I've had to correct you and chastise you because you weren't taking it serious. You were mislabeling. You was calling it spiritual warfare. And this exile and captivity is because you were not doing the work and the assignment that I set you apart for. And I gave you opportunities to repent. And so I'm, you're going to be carried away. You're going to be carried away into captivity. Your temple is going to be uh, trampled upon. Your houses will be damaged. But you might as well get settled when you go there. Because it ain't going to happen. It's not going to turn around quickly for you. You're going to have to endure the process. But the Lord says he knows the plans he has towards you. <laughs> I mean, that's the context of it. Plans of peace and not of evil to bring you into an expected end. So there's even love in God's correction. There is safety in God's discipline. I would rather be disciplined by God and stay in his favor whoo, than have a false sense of joy outside of his will. I wish I had some real believers to talk to me in here. I didn't like it when he was correcting me. I didn't like it when he was chastening me, but I found a scripture that encouraged me about the chastening of God. It says that God only takes the time to chasten those that he loves. Because if he let me keep getting away with it, I begin to wonder, has he changed his mind about me? He took the time to go over it with me again because he's more committed to my future than I am. I need you to touch somebody and tell him he wouldn't let me settle. He wouldn't let me settle. I begin to get comfortable in my dysfunction. I got comfortable in my compromise. I get comfortable in my sin. But God began to stir things in the nest. My God. And when I was having a challenge making a decision about doing the right thing, God let the thing that I was attached to make a decision about me. My God. Come on, because everything you walked away from, it wasn't because you felt like it. God had to let some things turn against you just to push you in the right direction. And I'm just going to give y'all 15 seconds. And if y'all didn't want to fake it, stay out of this praise. But I want to give you 15 seconds to praise God for the stuff that God shut down. God shut it down. Come on. God shut it down. It was God. I won't finish with it. Come on. But God shut it down. Something you used to enjoy started to make you sick. The smell of it made you sick. The person started to cause your stomach to turn. God shut it down. It was God. It was God. Because if God hadn't shut it down, you would still be in it. It was God. It was God. I mean, you're trying to fix it up now like it was your decision. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was God. There were some people had to leave your ministry. There were some people had to leave your life because you wouldn't have never sent them. You wouldn't have never released them. You would have still been trying to convince yourself that if you be good enough to them, they'll do better. Whoo! you kept trying to convince yourself to that person who cheated on you three or four times well they got childhood trauma and I understand guess what you got childhood trauma too that's why you still in it all of us got some sort of childhood trauma y'all gotta stop making excuses for people to keep staying in the situation and keep damaging you in the process you going into captivity but then there is a book that would probably encapsulate it as one book. There are two books. It would be probably encapsulated as Nehemiah Ezra. Because they're really in the same time period with the same subject matter. 
three uh, main characters of this book, uh, three protagonists, if you would, uh, in this Nehemiah Ezra book. The name Nehemiah, of course, Ezra and Zerubbabel. Uh, it's Saturday, so I'm going to hasten. Let me just give you enough of this. All three of them are working in the same time period, but they all got different assignments. Be very careful that just because you have proximity to other people don't mean you have the same assignment that they have. Stay in your lane. Do it like God told you to do it. We got too much cookie cutter ministry, cookie cutter lives. Everybody trying to do it like everybody else is doing it. I need you to look at your neighbor, tell your neighbor, do it like God told you to do it. You only got grace for your assignment. The moment you start trying to do it like somebody else is doing it, you're starting to run out of oil because God didn't anoint you for that. And sometimes what God has told you to do it and how God has told you to do it can seem counteractive to the culture. But let me tell you something. When God has called you to do something, he'll fix it that you can be successful in selling sand in a desert. I know what I'm talking about. It'll be something different about your sand. Hallelujah. You hear what I'm saying? And when God, it doesn't have to make sense to the people around you. It don't have to make sense to the people in your community. As a matter of fact, the wrong thing you can do in this season is get advice from somebody who didn't hear what you heard. To get advice from somebody that ain't doing what you're doing and ain't never been where God is taking you. Stick to the blueprint that God put in your hand even when you don't get it. Even when you don't understand it. Because when God has anointed you for something, what others did it will not work for you tell your neighbor that don't work for me I got to do it I know some of my ways for some people around me are antiquated and primitive but it's the way God gave it to me and when I go to battle I can't use Saul's armor and expect to fight my giant I got to use what is proven Oh, your yoke is too heavy for me your standard is too heavy for me your ideas are too complicated for me I'm still trying to figure out the instructions on how to work the armor that you put on me so what I think I'll do I'll take that off and I'll use what God gave me in the brook I'll use what God gave me when I was in the field because I practice for the moment of presentation I was practicing I didn't know I was but I was practicing for this moment of presentation. Shh. I tell people this is why I can preach in different environments. Because I've been practicing. I can preach when everybody's shouting behind me. And I also can preach to the Episcopalians like I do. I have an opportunity to share with the Anglicans and I do. And they don't say nothing when I'm preaching. I can handle it because when I was young, I was preaching to my stuffed animals then. And my army men, and when I was preaching to them, they didn't say nothing. I, I come to tell somebody God is about to make sense out of the miscellaneous pieces of your life. You have no idea. God is, was using all the things you thought was randomness to prepare you for the moment of presentation. Your feelings were hurt over the people who rejected you and you have no idea. They were just practice. Hallelujah. You, you still offended because they didn't include you. God said that was just practice. But the stage is about to turn. You ain't even got to a curtain opening yet. But I come to tell about 50 of you that will praise God now. There's a day that's coming that's getting ready to cause everything else to make sense. Everything else is about to make Everything else is everything else is about to make sense. So then you all be seated and I'll finish here. So then Nehemiah has an assignment to rebuild the wall. Ezra has an assignment to reinstate the Torah. And he was so convicted by us walking by the Torah. He even told those men who had been in exile. He said, y'all had ended up marrying these strange women and producing strange fruit by these women he said y'all need we, listen we going back to Jerusalem we got to rebuild this temple we got to rebuild this wall but you need to get rid of these unholy alliances <laughs> hallelujah I need you to look at your neighbor tell your neighbor that's what's been happening tell them God has been giving me an opportunity to sever myself from some unholy alliances 
And some of these unholy alliances, we fell into these alliances with good intentions. Oh, my God. And so Ezra said, no, we got to reinstate the Torah because this is how we ended up in this predicament that the Torah, the law of God was not the center of our worship. We start making up our own laws based upon our feelings. We start setting our own standard blessed based upon our emotions. So Nehemiah said, we got to rebuild the wall. And Ezra said, we got to reinstate the Torah. But then Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel says, all right, why y'all getting us to rebuild the wall? Ezra, why are you getting us to, to reinstate the Torah? This is why now, because of Ezra, is why we stand even today for the reading of God's word. Because when Ezra began to read the scrolls and the Torah of the Lord, that the people stood. They stood the whole time. Hallelujah. They stood the whole time in reverence uh, to, the, to the Torah because the Torah was precious. Everybody didn't have a copy at home. Everybody didn't have one in their iPad. So the word of God was so precious that they stood at attention. And my prayer is that the word of God would become precious to us again. Oh, hallelujah. I, I know now we quote Bishop. But it's, it's a one thing to quote Bishop, but you better know the word for yourself because the blacksmiths are under attack. You hear me? The blacksmiths are being polluted. They can't, they don't know how to, they don't know how to create weapons anymore that's the very thing that Saul did that's what the first thing that happened with Saul the Philistines when the Philistines attacked Israel they attacked the blacksmiths they attacked the ones who made weapons and now we're at an hour that the weapon makers are under attack and they are they don't know how to they don't know they don't know how they don't know how to make what they don't know how to make weapons they don't know how, they don't know how to stay with the word they don't know scripture hallelujah they got cliches and they make it up in conjuring prophecies and sorceries so that's why you got to know the word for yourself the blacksmiths are under attack you hear me there are not many weapons there's a famine in the land and it's not for bread or for water but it is for the word of God somebody shout I need the word at the end of the day I don't want to hear your political speech I want to hear the word I don't want to hear your ideas and your opinions I don't even want to hear your denominational dogma give me the word I know how they used to do it in the old school and I know the new school and all that new school old school blah 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 I want the word of God because at the end of the day heaven and earth huh, whoo, is going to pass away but his word is going to stand forever anybody other than me I'm just at a place in my life I don't want the show I don't want the show if I want to see a show I go to Vegas and see a show I go to Broadway and see a show I don't want the show I want the word I am dealing with real demons in my life and if I don't have something to fight with I'm going to be consumed I need the word of God I don't want to see your fancy outfit cute good job I want the word of God at the end of the day it's not your bio that's going to deliver me it's the word it's the word it's a rubble it says I got to rebuild this temple I got to try to get the temple rebuilt that's my assignment it's to rebuild is to rebuild the temple. That's my assignment. Is to rebuild the house of God. But the question is, Zerubbabel, but how you gonna do it? All you got is a measuring stick in your hand. All you got is a plummet. Hallelujah. And then the scripture says, Oh, Zerubbabel, how will this happen? And the scripture said in Zechariah, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit said the lord and i want to say this to you that are in the sanctuary and you that are watching online i am thankful for the advancement of technology in our church i think we should use all of it i believe jesus would have i believe apostle paul would have used all of the nuances and advancements of technology i know that because when paul got to mars hill he found an altar that was already established he found a platform he found a facebook <laughs> he found a he I'm just making reference he, made, he found a platform and it said to the, of the altar of the unknown God. And he used that platform to preach Jesus. And so I love the advancements, but hear me. Don't think our technology is going to be the thing that brings us into the fulfillment of this latter day glory. Mm -mm, no, no, no. It's not, we, we, we're in an hour when we feel like we got to have the best singer. And so we'll find the best singer. Whether their life lines up with the song or not. We can't have church unless we got the best musicians. 
And it don't matter if they smell like weed or not. We got a building fund. And we can't raise the money unless we get a profit. No matter whether they lying or not. We're doing all these things. But the scripture says, the reason that we're going to be able to accomplish this, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. I'm going to make an announcement and I need at least 15 people to go with me in this. I don't have to have everybody. I need about 15 intercessors. Because when I start preaching like this, people start pulling out weapons against me. And uh, I'm all right with it. As long as I got some Holy Ghost sharpshooters. Your programs are cute. Your technology is fancy. But in all of our advancement, you still need the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. We still need to get on the altar and get tears again. We still need the tissue on the altar again. We still need to roll in the floor. We still need to repent. We still need to cry out. We still need it. Because how in the world that we're smarter than any generation has ever been? We are. We're smarter. We got more information. Smarter but lack a whole lot of wisdom. All of the, We got a pill for everything. And before we grab the oil, we look for the medicine. And I'm not against medicine. God can use medicine. But my question is, how are we in the hour we're in? And we have all of these tools, but less power. Tell your neighbor, you can't build it without the Holy Ghost. Now, come on, give them eye contact. Tell them, I know you're working on some things, but you cannot build this without the Holy Ghost. God is going to fix it where he's going to keep himself employed in your life. Hire all the people you need to hire. Hire all the staff you want to hire, but you better make sure you and your staff know how to get carpet on your face and turn yourself to the altar. We need the Holy Ghost. This ain't normal. I need you to get out of your seat and tell three people, tell them your assignment is not normal. A, a CEO can't teach you how to do this. Come on, a COO can't teach you how to do this. Another entrepreneur expert can't teach you how to do this. You got to do this under the power of the Holy Ghost. This ain't normal. We're dealing with demons and witches and warlocks. We're dealing with emotional spectrums and political unrest all in one house. We're teaching K through college in the same room. It takes the Holy Ghost. It takes the Holy Ghost. And you're going to wear yourself out trying to do a spiritual assignment in your flesh. Hey! Come on, scream at the people on your Tell them, get out of your flesh. Get out of your... That's why you stay depressed so, so frequently. Get out of your flesh. That's why you keep dropping in the abyss emotionally. Because you're trying to do it in your flesh. Get out of your head and get in the spirit. Get out of your head and get in the spirit. Stop Googling everybody else's ministry and get in the spirit. Stop Googling everybody else's pattern and get in the spirit. And let God give you something custom made for your assignment. Oh, oh. Glory be to God. We build this temple. And after 70 years, the people are coming back. Because Ezra said, Y'all come on back. Our captivity, y'all be seated next time we get up our, our close. <laughs> after, y'all come on back. We came back. Let's build the wall so we'll be safe. Okay. Now let's. Let's build a temple. Let's build a temple. And then Haggai comes along and says, hold on, y'all. Haggai says, y'all, y'all didn't got comfortable building y'all's houses. But, but look at the temple. It's lying in waste. Because I know what y'all said, you know, after we get our house straightened out, you know, then we'll start working on the ministry. He said, but now your house got extra shingles and Y'all got a new roof. Y'all paving parking lots now. And look at the house of God. You're too busy now. You, don't, you can't serve anymore. You're too busy. You, know, you got other things going on. 
we'll be out of town for the whole month of, of and there used to be a time when I was growing up in church, and I know that may be old school now, but when we were going out of town on vacation, we left our offering. Nobody had to tell us. We left our tithe and offering. And then they would say, uh, the, the youngest are out of town, but they left their tithes and offering. That was an accountability. And it also communicated that although we were taking our time for ourselves, we care about the ministry. We care about the temple. That it ain't just about us. We are part of something that's bigger than us. As a matter of fact, I had to make sure that everything was covered. I had to make sure everything was covered while I was gone. Because if it fails while I'm gone, that's a reflection of my leadership. You know why this conversation don't make a lot of sense for some of you in this room? Because you're not serving anywhere. I didn't say you're not a member anywhere. I said you're not serving. And our generation is a generation of consumers. And we are professional consumers and we have reviews on everybody's restaurant. We got reviews on everybody's church. We got reviews on everybody's concert. And you ain't never built one yourself. You are critic with no experience. Mm. And the Bible said they built the temple. They had to get stirred. He had to stir them. So every so often a prophetic voice has to come in your life and stir you. I said a prophetic voice, not necessarily somebody with the title prophet. A prophetic voice can be your grandmother. Like mine is watching right now. It's 91 years old. Sometimes I go in there and sit down and say, and I sit down beside her. We'll be just a small talk. And then she said, yeah, somebody need to slow down. Because see, when you're when you're going so fast, some other things can be happening and you don't know. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to stay home this week because I need to see what's going on. <laughs> now, she ain't a gossiper and she ain't going to, she, she, she has to watch church online. So I know she ain't in no circles. It's, she's a prophetic voice. And every so often you need, to, you need to make sure you keep prophetic voices in your life. People, people who don't have a dog in the fight. No more than they just got love for you. They want the best for you. See, what happens is we center ourselves around people who massage our feelings and co-sign what we already want to hear. But I need somebody to say, no, 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 that, that's not now. No, not now, not now. Maybe you try that another time, not now. You need somebody to say, oh, where, you, where you going? You wearing that? You ain't wearing it. No, you ain't wearing it. I know you ain't wearing it to church. You need somebody. Come on. You need prophetic voices in your life. They say, I see you've been hanging around uh, so, so, so and so. You're like, yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, just be very careful. Come on. You need people in your life that can see what you can't see. Or see what you don't want to see. And Hagar had to tell him, consider your ways. Re remember why God brought you back here. Consider your ways. Remember why God gave you that talent. Consider your ways. Remember why you became a preacher. Why you became a pastor. He won't nothing about no more than I love God. Because many of us ran from it. We cried in the process. Then we said, we finally said, yes, Lord. And we paid a price and still making payments. He said, consider your ways. And so they built it. They started laying, they laid the foundation. And at the foundation, it's like a cornerstone. If anybody ever been to a, a cornerstone, a dedication of a building, that dedication ceremony starts at, with the laying of the cornerstone. Like what some of us do call a, uh, you know, get the shovel and we do that groundbreaking. Put a cornerstone and it's just the foundation of the temple. It's the, the foundation of the second temple. <sighs> and the Bible said when the foundation when they, it was laid, it says the foundation is officially laid. And you heard ah, 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 ah. It was a noise that was all over the place. 
and I hear it now. Oh, I hear it. Oh, I hear it. I hear it in church when we're in the middle of these strong praise breaks. That the worship leader and the preacher tries to label the praise break for us. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. He turned it. He's about to turn it. And all of us, hallelujah. He's about to turn it. And somebody's going, oh, Jesus. Jesus. It's, it's, a, it's a noise. Why was it such a mixed sound? Because the new generation was like, wow, we got to see the land of the foundation of the, of the new temple. But the older generation was like, wow, this is nothing in comparison. God brought us back for this. I survived to see this. The size of this foundation is nowhere close to the size of the foundation of Solomon's temple that had tons of gold, tons of silver, granite and marble, cedar wood. And look at this. And, and I'm not saying anything because I don't want to rain on your parade. But this is not what I expected. When I told God I was going to do this, this is not what I expected. When you got married, yay! You saw the wedding, but you didn't see the marriage. Everybody just looked this way. No, no, it's been some great days. But the days that hurt, if you would have known about it, you may not have never chose it. Yes, If you knew that traveling on the road every week meant that you would lose a sense of where home is. For you to rush home, I can't wait to get home. I can't wait to get home. I can't wait to get home to get to a home with nothing but plants. And you're reminded that you sacrificed a relationship so you could serve your assignment. <sighs> if you knew being a being a boss man and a boss woman meant that you would have to work in a space where you felt like a stranger yourself, that all of them can talk to each other, but there's nobody who can handle your conversation. <gasps> look, oh look what God is doing for you yes look at the doors God is opening for you yes so when I started in my storefront and God gave me a vision of an eight sided cathedral with a wrap around balcony I had it drawn out the young lady who drew it out lives here in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. She's a pastor's wife, Char Sherelle Howard. She gave it to me as a gift in the first year of our church. She said, you told me what the vision is. I had it drawn out. She graduated from North Carolina a t State University with a degree in architectural design. And she handed it to me on her wedding day as a gift. And I put it on the wall and I kept praying and speaking over it and speaking over it and speaking over it and speaking over it. So we moved from, from the storefront to a warehouse and I put it on the wall and I kept speaking over it and speaking over it and speaking over it. Then we moved from the warehouse to, to a church building, a cathedral ceiling with stained glass windows. And I still, even though I was thankful for that building, I put the eight-sided cathedral on the wall and I kept speaking over it and kept speaking over it. But finally got to a place. Well, I almost stopped speaking over it. You know why? I almost settled. I'm preaching to somebody. I'm not screaming, but I'm preaching to somebody. I'm, I am talking to somebody in the Holy Ghost right now. I almost settled. I almost got to the point where I didn't want it. I didn't expect it. I stopped looking for it. And I started remodeling the bathrooms of the place I was in. Because if God was going to do it, 
He's now changed his mind. It would have been one thing if the ride had been smooth. But I told you how I went from the storefront to the, to the warehouse and from the warehouse to the cathedral. But the part I did not tell you was the days the lights got cut off at the storefront. And the local preachers were up preaching against me saying that my church was going to disband shortly because we had nothing but young people. I told you about the warehouse, but I didn't tell you about the warehouse where I was drowning financially with a bunch of college students. And the college across the street wrote a missive and called me a cult leader and called my church a cult. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And while I'm trying to preach on the road and bring all my money back home to pay the bills of the church, I get a phone call that the church just got flooded and we don't have flood insurance. I told you how I got to the cathedral, but I didn't tell you I got to the cathedral because somebody bought the building from up under me that I was in and I had to find somewhere else to go. And so at this point, I don't want another place. At this point, I don't want another prophecy. At this point, I'm good. I come to frustrate somebody who almost settled because of the price you've had to pay in the past. <laughs> I'm talking to somebody who, while we're celebrating on the inside, you shouting, I don't know if I can handle another disappointment. So, so I won't get disappointed. I leave my expectation low. So, so I won't be disappointed. I stop expecting anything greater than what I have right now. Hallelujah. And the Bible says those people begin uh, to cry. And my question is, how have we ended up being disappointed? Because many of us have put our expectation on people. David says, my expectation is on the Lord. Because people are fickle. Let me tell you something. Whatever God is going to do with you, he does not have to use the people you thought he was going to use. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. I'm going to preach. I'm going to prophesy to somebody in this room. Scream at somebody. Tell them it may not be the people you thought, but it's still going to happen. Hallelujah. Because some of the people you grew up with and people told you y'all wouldn't be friends today, you wouldn't have believed it. There's some people who were in ministry with you. You felt like they had your back and they did. And they had a knife in their hand in the process. But scream at your neighbor. Tell your neighbor it's still going to happen. But it may not be with the people you thought. Hallelujah. God can use them or he can dismiss them. But God I don't need that help to bring it to pass. Hallelujah. I heard David, Jonathan, and his armor brass says, God can do it by few or he can do it by many. I need you to pull on your neighbor and say, neighbor, God is stirring your expectation. My expectation is not on the government. My expectation is not on the American economy. No matter what the economy does, I'm going to say this boldly. No matter what the economy does, I'm going I'll say it boldly no matter what the economy does God will provide for the saints Shira declares to us that he shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory look at your neighbor tell your neighbor say neighbor put your expectations on Jesus church people will disappoint you parents will disappoint you children will disappoint you and the earliest convenience you can do this get to a mirror and look at the other person that has the potential to disappoint you look at your neighbor tell your neighbor I was disappointed in my own self I ended up saying something I knew I shouldn't have said and I cannot get it back I ended up doing something that was beneath my standard and I can't undo it but my expectation is shifting I want you to touch two people tell them my expectation is shifting I start looking at man I start looking at people I start looking at systems and conventions and governments but I declare my expectation is on Jesus. He'll never disappoint. How 
is us disappointed in our expectations uh, because many of us had had the wrong expectations uh, we were looking for the wrong thing uh, it's going to be everything God said uh, but it may not look the way you thought uh, God is so faithful to his word uh, that when we look at his word uh, we look at a prism uh, and sometimes we see things distorted uh, Paul says it like this we're looking uh, through a glass darkly uh, but in just a little while uh, what was blurry uh, God is about to make it clear uh, he's about to take the vision uh, and he's about to make it plain uh, lay hands on your neighbor and prophesy uh, and say neighbor uh, God is about to clear it up uh, you're going to know what he's saying uh, you're going to hear what he's saying uh, he's about to clear up the confusion uh, about where you should be uh, and what you should be doing uh, and that's why we need the word of God uh, because the psalm is declared uh, that word uh, is a lamp unto my feet uh, and a light unto my path uh, in other words the word tells me uh, where I am in my journey uh, and it shows me uh, where I'm going uh, I need you to push your neighbor uh, and tell him he's going to make it clear because some of you your prayer has been uh, Lord show me uh, I want to be in your will uh, Lord show me uh, I want to walk in your path uh, keep me in your pathway Lord I don't want to stumble uh, and I don't want to fall uh, keep me in your pathway Lord uh, in seasons past uh, I chose for myself uh, but I'm at a different place now uh, I'm a little bit more mature uh, than I was in past times uh, I want God's will uh, for my life uh, cause God's will uh, is good uh, God's will uh, is perfect uh, and God's will is acceptable uh, lift up your hands uh, and say oh God uh, I want your will uh, for my life uh, the Bible declares uh, delight yourself uh, also in the Lord uh, and he will give you uh, the desires uh, of your heart uh, many of you uh, are trying to make a claim uh, for your desires uh, and you haven't delighted uh, you gotta delight first uh, cause God himself knows uh, if you delight yourself uh, he'll begin to change uh, some of your desires uh, he'll begin to change uh, some of your prayers uh, he'll begin to change uh, your expectation uh, they had expectations uh, on Jesus uh, but they had the wrong uh, expectation uh, when 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 uh, when they saw the Messiah coming uh, they said Hosanna Hosanna uh, they were looking for him uh, to overthrow uh, the Roman government uh, but instead uh, of coming in on a horse uh, he chose uh, to come in on a donkey uh, a horse means uh, he came to bring war uh, but the donkey means uh, he came to bring peace uh, for our God our God uh, is the prince uh, of peace uh, they were expecting uh, one thing uh, but he brought another uh, but I want you to look at your neighbor uh, and said neighbor uh, I was in my feelings uh, but I feel different now uh, tell him I'm so glad no y'all gotta shout it loud tell him uh, I'm so glad God didn't give me what I expected my 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 the Bible declared there was a lame man he was laying by the gate in Acts a gate called beautiful and he was sitting there asking for alms of all the people that were walking in and he looked at Peter and John expecting to get a few dollars expecting to get something for a sandwich and he stretched out his hand but Peter and John looked on him and said silver and gold have I none but such as I have I 
But he got something better in mind. Tell somebody God's got something better in mind. You were disappointed, be honest. And to Mr. All the shouting, there were some services where your tears were not tears of joy. They were complex. You said, Lord, I thank you that things are as well as they are. But this is not what I expect. Lord, I thank you for my blessings. And it's not that I'm great ungrateful, but this ain't what I expected. I want you to grab somebody by the hand. And listen, one reason why it was hard for them to rejoice, because in the distance from the new temple foundation were the ruins of the old temple. And what you lost sometimes can be distracted. The ticker. Sometimes you're trying to move forward, but you, you're looking at like, I wasted a lot of time. I wasted time with that connection. I wasted time in that ministry. I wasted time in that relationship. I wasted time in that job. There's some things you thought were going to be forever. And that's why, now while you're trying to start new, you're constantly reminded on your timeline constantly reminded when people around you asking, hey, how's Keisha doing? And you're like, I guess she's doing good. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Anybody can praise them at the completion of the temple. I'm going to give now, like I said, this, this message tonight was prophetic. And so, Maybe you're an onlooker and you can just encourage others. But if this message was for you tonight, I'm going to ask you to do something very crazy. And this is going to be crazy. You have to perceive this in your spirit. The people were crying because they saw the ruins of the old temple. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to do something crazy. I want you to dance on the ruins of what didn't work out. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah. I thank God for saving me out of all the things that I've experienced in life. Nothing compares to accepting Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. If you are not saved and you have not experienced the saving power of Jesus Christ right where you are, ask him. Ask him to save you and he'll meet you at the point of your need. If you need to connect with someone or someone to pray with you, send your prayer request or call the number on the screen and we will be there to share Jesus Christ and the message of hope with you. I wanna thank all of you who have been supporting our ministry down through the years. It's because of you that we've expanded this YouTube channel. We've expanded all on the outlets that you're hearing uh, this message. So what I want you to do is make sure you share, make sure you subscribe and send this message to someone who needs to hear it. And for all of you who desire to support our ministry, there are ways to give on the screen. And remember when you sow into our ministry, you're not just helping us do ministry domestically, but you're partnering with what we're doing all over the world. The seed may leave your hand, but it will never leave your life. This is Bishop S.Y. Young. We're saying go with God because he's already going with you. God bless.